vulnerable Tasmanians Senator Brown deserve being 2 better. PM. Uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Payne will be absent from question time on Wednesday 4 and Thursday 5 December uh, 2019 due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Payne's absence, Senator Birmingham will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Women. Uh, Senator Cash will represent the Attorney General and the Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Can the minister confirm that the national accounts released today have revealed economic growth actually went backwards compared to the last quarter and that annual growth is currently sitting at just 1.7 per cent, well below your government's budget forecast of 2.75 per cent? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank the uh, Shadow Minister for Finance for a question on the economy. Uh, today's national accounts confirm that the Australian economy uh, continues to grow, remains remarkably resilient uh, in the face of significant global and domestic economic headwinds. Economic growth has increased. Economic growth has increased to 1.7 per cent through the year, with the economy growing by 0.4 per cent in the September quarter within the range of market expectations. While other major developed economies like Germany, the UK, Korea and Singapore experienced negative quarters of economic growth this year, Australia's economy continues to grow and has now ended its 29th consecutive year of economic growth, a record not much by any other developed uh, nation. Uh, and I might, also just say, I might also just say that household disposable income grew by 2.5 per cent in the quarter and is up 5.1 per cent over the year. Up 5.1 per cent over the year. This is the strongest quarterly rise in a decade with the personal income tax cuts flowing through. The average compensation per employee rose 0.7 per cent in the quarter to be 2.9 per cent higher over the year and is now back above the decade average. Just imagine, Mr. President, just imagine for one second what would have happened if the Australian people had chosen to vote for the alternative into government and $387 billion in higher taxes had hit our economy for six. Order. Our Senator economy Coleman, today would be Senator weak. Gallagher on a point of order. A uh, point of order, Mr. President. You brought the Leader of the Opposition to uh, address the comments through the Chair earlier in debate today. And I just ask you to be consistent and bring the Leader of the Government to that standing. Quite order. right. All, all comments should be addressed through the Chair. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. The point I was making is uh, that the economy, our economy continues to grow, and our economy is stronger than it would have been uh, if the Australian people uh, in their, had, had chosen a different government at the last election. Because, of course, on the back of $387 billion in higher taxes, uh, our economy would have been weaker, uh, employment growth would have been weaker, unemployment would have been higher, and Order. wages would have been lower. Instead, of course, we've got 1.7 per cent growth through the year, uh, with, which is, of course, uh, higher than what we had through the year to the end of the uh, June quarter. Uh, and indeed, household disposable income grew by 2.5 per cent. Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher, a well, supplementary I'm sure question. we'll get the rest of that script, Mr. President. But uh, my supplementary. <laughs> The ABS uh, also said today, and I quote, the reduction to tax payable did not translate to a rise in discretionary spending. Can the minister confirm that household final consumption, growing at just 0.1 of a per cent, is the lowest quarterly increase since the height of the GFC? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. What I can confirm is that consumption is stronger than it would have been uh, if we had not delivered. If we had not. If we had not delivered. If we had not delivered personal income tax cuts. I would just. I would just make the point. As I would just make. I, I would just Senator make the Watt. point. And you know, maybe the socialists on the other side uh, want to tell the Australian people what to do with their money. We actually trust the Australian people to decide what they do with their money. The reason we deliver personal income tax cuts is because we trust uh, individual Australians and businesses around Australia uh, to be able to make the best possible decisions on how they use their money. And that is, that is, precisely, that is precisely what we're doing. And let me tell you, uh, the Australian economy... Oh, it said of uh, what says, has it worked? Has it worked? Well, uh, has it worked? I mean, the Labor Party, the Labor Party when they Senator last were in Watt. government, left behind a weakening economy, rising unemployment, and a rapidly deteriorating budget position. Uh, the uh, economic growth has, of course, strengthened through the year to 1.7%, and Time we will continue to work.
Senator Watt, I remind you to count for a little while before you interject following me calling your name again. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. In dismissing the June quarter results that have actually turned out to be stronger than those released today, the minister said, and I quote, what will matter is what comes out at the end of the day when the September quarter results are released in early December. And I end of quote. Given annual economic growth continues to have a one in front of it, does the minister now accept that not having an economic plan is hurting working Australians? Senator Cormann. I completely reject the premise of the question, and I just remind Senator I would just remind Senator Gallagher again economic growth has increased. Well, I reject the conclusion she is reaching. Order. Economic growth Senator has Wong. increased, increased to 1.7 per cent through the year. So she is quite right in quoting that part of my previous statement that what matters is what comes out at the end of the September quarters. And what, that, what it shows, what it shows actually, uh, is uh, that economic growth has increased uh, to 1.7 per cent through the year, increased, that our economy continues to grow where other economies are shrinking, that real GDP grew by, um, obviously by 1.7 per cent uh, through the year, that household disposable income grew by 2.5 per cent in the quarter, and is up 5.1 per cent over the year, the strongest quarterly rise in a decade with the personal income tax cuts clearly flowing through and the average compensation per employee, employee rising by, by 0.7 per cent in the quarter to be 2.9 per cent higher over the year, which is also now back above the decade average. So things are heading Order, in the right Senator direction Coleman, in the context of significant the global has economic headwind. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the, minister, can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's sound budget and economic management is guaranteeing essential health services, like strengthening the pharmaceutical benefits scheme? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I'll take that uh, interjection from Senator Watt because, Senator Watt, one of the benefits of a strong economy, and that is exactly what we are talking about, is the ability to provide for the essential services that Australians rely on, and in this regard, our health system. But in particular, the coalition government's record of listing life-saving and life-changing drugs on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Mr President, I often now get to stand up in this chamber and update the Senate on the announcements that our health minister makes in relation to the further listing of life-saving and life-changing drugs. And yet again, today, I am very pleased to announce to the Senate that the health minister has recently announced colleagues further listings on the PBS, including that more than 2,200 patients with metastatic non -cell, uh, small cell lung cancer will now be able to access the drug. It's a very well-known drug, Mr President. Ketruda, as a first-line treatment in combination with chemotherapy. Mr President, as a result of our strong economy, the Health Minister has now ensured that Australians with lung cancer will have the broadest access to Ketruda in the world. Mr President, if it, not, if it was not for this listing, those patients requiring Ketruda would have paid up to $120,000 a year, depending on their specific cancer subtype. What this does in terms of our listings is, since coming to office in 2013, the coalition government has now invested over $10.7 billion in life-saving and life-changing medicines on the PBS. Mr President, that is over 2,200 new or amended listings, and of course that now equates to approximately one medicine every day since we've been in government we add Order. to the PBS. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on how the policy framework on the policy framework that has achieved these health outcomes for Australians? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, again, because on this side of the chamber, the coalition side of the chamber, we understand that by keeping our economy as strong, as strong we are able to invest in uh, the essential services, in this case, uh, the health services that Australians rely on. And, Senator Smith, as a result of our economic plan, um, we're able to make record investments in our health system. These include increasing funding for the nation's public hospitals from $13.3 billion in 2012-13 to $22.5 billion colleagues in 2019-20, growing by 69 per cent and colleagues 
our investment will reach $29.1 billion in 2024-25. But we've also been able to make, again because of the strong economy, record investments in mental health over $5.3 billion in 2019-20. Again, if you run a strong economy, these are the dividends that you can give back to Australians. Order. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How do, how, did, how do these achievements differ from the approaches of previous governments? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, in relation to the, the listings that I have referred to um, over a number of question times, each of these listings has been recommended by the Independent Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, and the Health Minister and the government have accepted those recommendations. This course of action it differs wildly from what those on the other side of the chamber did the last time they were in government. They were so fiscally incompetent they actually stopped. Stop, Mr. President, Order. listing life-saving and life-changing drugs on the PBS. This is despite the recommendations from the Independent Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee that drugs should be listed. In fact, in 2011, Labor's budget papers themselves state the listing of some medicines will be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. Well, Mr. President, those fiscal circumstances now permit the listing of these important medications. Order. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When forcing the Medivac repeal bill through the Senate, the Minister told the Senate, and I quote, There is no secret deal. But 20 minutes later, Senator Lambie told the Senate, and I quote, I put up to the government a proposal to work with me to secure my support for the passage of the repeal of Medivac. I genuinely can't say what I proposed. Which statement is correct? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. The first point I would make is that these statements are actually not inconsistent with each other. That's Order. the first point I would make. The second point I would make, the second point I would make again, is that there is absolutely no secret deal. The government has not agreed to any changes in policy or uh, administration when it comes to our border protection or resettlement arrangements. What we have done, what we have done, and we very much appreciate the works, the way Senator Lambie has engaged with us. We have provided her with extensive and detailed briefings. We have provided her with classified briefings uh, about the way the government is going about protecting our borders and going about making sure uh, that uh, asylum seekers receive uh, appropriate medical treatment and about making sure that she fully understood what we are doing to properly give effect to resettlement arrangements. And as I said, as I said, these briefings were at the classified secret level. Uh, she, of course, might uh, made it her business to better understand what the government was actually doing. And at the end of that process, uh, Senator Lambie made clear through her vote in this chamber that she was satisfied that the conditions were met for the Medivac uh, bill to be repealed, as it should be. Because Labor's uh, and the Greens' uh, Medivac bill was bad legislation. It weakened our national security arrangements, whereas Senator Lambie and the majority of senators have voted for stronger national security arrangements. And we and, we and all Australians very much thank uh, Senator Lambie for that. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. In relation to the New Zealand arrangement, Prime Minister Morrison has warned that, and I quote, in terms of Australia's security interests and how we manage our borders, we don't believe it's consistent with that and has said, I quote, the Australian government has no plans to take up that arrangement whatsoever. Has the government reopened the negotiations with New Zealand on their offer? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The government has made absolutely no changes to our policy uh, arrangements in relation to border protection or uh, resettlement uh, compared to the way they're currently in place. We continue uh, to implement our policies uh, and there's been no change as a result order. of discussions. Senator Wong on a point of order. A point of order is direct relevance. The question goes to, is a simple question, whether or not the government ha has reopened negotiations with New Zealand on their offer. Uh, Senator Wong, you've restated the question. With respect, I believe the minister is being directly relevant by addressing government policy. Um, 
I don't believe I can rule out what he's saying on the grounds of direct relevance. Senator, Senator Wong. Mr. President, I'm sorry. Submission. So your ruling is a question about reopening, whether or not negotiations have been reopened with New Zealand. It is direct. I'm, I'm clarifying the ruling, uh, and I'm reminding. Uh, I'm referring to this, the president's ruling uh, on December the second, which an answer must directly refer to or address assertions contained in a question or preamble. Is the ruling that policy includes whether or not negotiations has opened? Because well, I, I, I would submit to you, Mr President, that's not consistent with well, I, I think uh, the, there was, there the, was, the ordinary meaning of the words. There was a quotation before that, um, and I believe the minister is being directly relevant to part of the question. I have, didn't get all the quotation down, but it did refer to a quotation from the Prime Minister about Australian policy. Australian government policy. I think the minister is being re directly relevant in that sense. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me confirm again that Australian government policy on border protection and resettlement arrangements has not changed as a result of discussions but to facilitate passage of the Medivac yeah. repeal bill through the Senate. Senator Keneally, final supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that, contrary to past statements, the government does now have plans to take up New Zealand's offer? to resettle refugees. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. No, I cannot confirm that. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is also for the Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann, in your response just then uh, to Senator Keneally's question, uh, firstly, uh, you, say, you say there's no secret deal. Senator Lambie says she'd only support the Government's proposal on the basis of a secret deal. You say those two things are inconsistent. How are they? Uh, you say those two things are consistent. How are they consistent? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Lambie does, did not say what Senator Di Natale uh, alleged. Uh, Senator Di Natale is uh, verbaling uh, Senator Lambie with the greatest of respect, uh, and therefore the, uh, you know, I reject the premise of the question. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Do this, uh, Minister. Has there been an exchange of letters? between a Minister of the Crown and Senator Lambie relating to the repeal of the Medivac legislation? And if so, do those letters contain any undertakings by either party that go beyond the repeal of the Medivac legislation? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, firstly, I will not go into private conversations oh, with crossbench right. senators. Order. Order. We never do. We never do. And that applies to conversations with Senator Di Natale in the same way as it applies to Order. conversations with Senator Wong, as it applies to any other conversations. What I can say is that there has been no deal to change any policy on order. border protection Senator or Coleman anything else. On a, on, 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 Senator Di Natale on a point of order. Mr President, there was no preamble. It was a very direct question. Has there been an exchange of letters? Um, and does no, he didn't say no. Well, he didn't Senator, Senator no. Di Natale, with all Has due respect, has there been an exchange of Senator, letters? You, you, and I haven't Senator, finished. No, what is the point of order, though, Senator Di Natale? It can't be that you don't like the answer. It needs to be about it's direct relevance. relevance. Point of order is on relevance. Uh, has there been an exchange of letters? And if so, are there any undertakings that go beyond give, the repeal of the Medivac legislation? Right. It's a very straightforward that, question. I, I give senators advance warning that when we come back next year, I'm going to be much more strict on simply people standing up, saying relevance, and reading out a question again. Because I did ask you to come to the direct, and you simply restated the question, Senator Di Natale. I'll come to you in a moment, Senator Wong. I'd like to rule on this, unless you're making a submission on this point. On the Wong. I'm making a submission on the ruling you just made, Mr. President. Whilst I understand it is inconvenient for the government for questions to be restated, I again submit to you, and I would ask if you intend to change this procedure that you take submissions and engage with all parties to this place, that it is relevant to a claim that a minister is not being directly relevant to restate that aspect of the, the relevant aspect of the question. And, and so, Senator, simply dis with respect, Mr. President, simply dismissing points of order on the basis that we are restating the question is, in my submission, unfair and un inconsistent with the standing order. So, I would like the opportunity okay. for all parties to make submissions if you well, intend Senator to change Wong, the procedure. If, if, uh, I did not say one could not restate the question. I simply said that someone can't get up, yell the word relevance, and then read out the question again. I want a point of order to draw the point as to why the answer is not directly relevant. That requires a little bit of effort and is, not, is an effort that most senators go to the trouble of. Simply the word relevance and then restating it is not sufficient to comply with the standing orders. On this, Senator Di Natale, 
In, the, in your submission yourself then, you alluded to the fact that you did not like the, what the minister was saying in response. I do not believe—can uh, I make my ruling before the interjections start, and then I'll take more submissions? My point is that the minister—I cannot instruct him how to answer a question. I cannot instruct him to address a particular part of a question. Your question was specific. In my view, he was being specific in the answer, even if that was not the answer sought. And there is an opportunity to debate that after question time. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let me say again, we provided uh, Senator Lambie with detailed briefings, detailed briefings at a classified level. We did not provide any undertakings to change policy on border protection or resettlement arrangements or on anything else in order to secure the support uh, of Senator Lambie for uh, the legislation that went through the Senate earlier today. Uh, Senator, D uh, Senator Lambie, as she has stated, raised uh, various issues to us. She, she raised various issues to us. She put a proposal to us. And what we, and what we did is we provided detailed briefings, detailed Order, explanations Senator of what Coleman. we were already Time doing. Time for the answers expired. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. In a, a simple yes or no answer would be fine here, Minister. Did you provide an exchange of letters with, Minister, with uh, uh, Ms Lambie, Senator Lambie, and if so, did those letters go beyond the repeal of the Medivac legislation? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, firstly, I did not. Uh, secondly, uh, again, uh, the government has not made any commitments at all to change policy on border protection, on resettlement arrangements or anything else in order to secure the vote of Senator Lambie. What we have done is provide detailed briefings, detailed information about what the policies of the government are at a secret level, at a classified order, secret level. Order, Senator Dinatale, on a point of order. Uh, just to be, rather than a um, uh, point of order on relevance, yep. uh, just being a bit tricky with answers, the minister is representing the Prime Minister. Uh, my question is asked on behalf of him as a representative of the Prime Minister. So did the minister uh, as a representative of the Prime Minister, did he or the Prime Minister provide an exchange of letters? On, at the commencement of your original question, I thought, and I'm happy to be corrected, you addressed it to Senator Cormann as the Leader of the Government. Um, I've given you the opportunity to, to, to specify that. I think in this case, with respect, the Minister is being directly relevant by providing information that I consider to be directly relevant to your very specific question, but I am listening carefully to ensure he stays within those bounds, and I believe he is. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Let me say again, we provided detailed information and briefings at a classified uh, secret uh, level to Senator Lambie. In the end, Senator Lambie was satisfied that the repeal of the Medivac legislation was in the public interest and voted for it. We did not make any undertakings to change policy on border protection or or resettlement arrangements or anything else in return for a vote uh, to support the Medivac repeal legislation. I will uh, take on notice to assess whether there is anything else that we can provide you in response to that question. But let me just, let me just say again, there is no deal. All there was was an explanation of why the Medivac repeal Order legislation Senator was important Cormann. and necessary. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister update the Senate? on how the sound budget and economic management of the Liberal and Nationals government is helping to strengthen our agriculture sector, including initiatives to help this vital industry grow to $100 billion by 2030. The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator McMahon, for your question. And as a proud Territorian and all of us on this side, uh, we want to see a profitable and sustainable agricultural sector. And the best Christmas present our farmers could hope for is a very long and sustained reign. But in the absence of that, it's a coalition government holding the Treasury benches and delivering real and practical support for our farmers as they're doing it tough. Now, it's been fascinating to watch the Labor Party this week try and know how to say the word farmer, spell dairy, uh, understand food processing. Because you know what, at the last election, those opposite didn't even take an agriculture policy to the federal election. You didn't even bother. You didn't even bother. That's the actual real regard that they hold this sector 
that delivers $60 billion to the economy and employs over 700,000 Australians on farm, in regional communities and out in the food manufacturing sector. It's disappointing that your solution to your policy vacuums to buddy up, buddy up with a certain political party who does not have the best interests of farmers at heart. But you know, just in the past week, I've been asked what we're doing for agriculture, and I'll just let you know it's only Wednesday. But what we've done this week today, we announced uh, nearly two million dollars for Farm Safe to make sure our farms are safe places to work. We're actually streamlining our export legislation to make sure farmers can access overseas market. Our Australian wine industry will be able to protect their valuable IP. Uh, we've got trade and market access assisting through uh, increasing the value of agriculture. We've actually supported cooperatives uh, to ensure that they can assist primary producers to butt up against the big end of town. We're delivering week in and week out for the agriculture sector. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Wonderful to hear. Can the minister, and I'll bet she can, can she update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is on the side of farmers and regional Australians. <laughs> Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very Order. much, Mr. President. Well, we are the ones delivering for our farmers, delivering for our fishers and our foresters. It is the Liberal national parties in this place that actually stand up and back the regions. Look at dairy. We actually have a real plan with dairy farmers' interests best at, uh, at our forefront. We're not after a cheap headline. We're after an actually a sustainable and profitable industry going forward. We intend to make sure that mandatory code of conduct is in operational by the 1st of January to put fairness back in place uh, with the relationship between farmers and processors. We've got over $8 million into the ACCC to um, actually ensure we've got a dairy specialist unit. And we've actually got $10 million worth of grants available to upgrade energy efficiency on farm, which is exactly what the Melander dairy farmers in North Queensland are actually incredibly excited about because they're paying exorbitant prices thanks to the Queensland state government for their electricity. Order. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches to deliver for the Australian agriculture industry? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. Look, Senator McMahon, unfortunately I can tell you there actually isn't an alternative approach for agriculture in this country. They didn't take a policy to the election. They don't have a vision for a prosperous and sustainable agriculture sector. Wouldn't it be nice if those opposites' concern uh, for dairy was actually heartfelt? But until recently, and I've checked the Hansard, there aren't too many of them that actually said the word dairy farmer in this place, despite their long careers. Agriculture, farmer, water, Sterlo, you have, you have. Um, Australian dairy farmers actually deserve real and practical support, far beyond your simple slogans, poor policy decisions and bad, simply what's bad economics. Your unity ticket to establish a floor price for dairy farmers would achieve the exact opposite of what you're wanting to achieve. It would see milk uh, that's produced in other states where the cost of production is very low flood Order, the market Senator in Queensland. McKenzie, Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Today's national accounts figures have revealed the Australian economy continues to grow at less than 2 per cent per annum, at just 1.7 per cent. Can the Minister confirm that under the Morrison government economic growth remains at its lowest levels since the global financial crisis? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. But thank you very much, Mr President. What I can confirm is that uh, the growth in our economy is stronger than it would have been if there had been a change of government at the last election. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Today's national accounts reveal household spending up just 0.1 per cent. Isn't this because, under Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg, Australians are experiencing the worst wages growth on record, and the RBA has declared that lower wage rises have become the new normal. Given Sen Minister Cormann considers low wage growth to be a deliberate design feature of the government's economic policies, 
Is this a case of Order, mission accomplished? Senator Walsh. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the last part of that question is manifestly false. That is actually not what I consider and not what I've ever said. Uh, it is a uh, con continuous misrepresentation of uh, those opposites uh, in relation to much more, uh, much more appropriate comments. We, are in we, of course, want to see stronger wages growth, but we also understand uh, that, you know, obviously, we also, we also understand that stronger wages growth uh, rely on stronger economic growth, stronger productivity growth, yeah. all things that we are working to achieve. And let me say uh, to the Senator again that uh, the economy is stronger, jobs growth is stronger, wages growth is stronger than it would have been if there had been a change of government. And indeed, her assertion that wages growth uh, is uh, the weakest ever is also false. I mean, real wages growth is right on uh, the 20-year average of 0.6 per cent, 0.6 per cent. And in fact, wages, real wages growth is stronger than it was when Labor lost government, stronger than it was when Labor lost government. The the minimum wage, the minimum wage has had real increases in every year that we've been in government. People had Order, real wages Senator cuts Cormann, in the minimum wage the when you were in government. Has expired. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, despite the minister's attempts to spin today's results and put lipstick on a pig, growth with a one in front of it is nothing to celebrate. When will the Morrison government finally implement a comprehensive plan to turn around the economy that is floundering under its watch? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The only thing that is floundering is the attempts by the Shadow Treasurer to get Albo's job. I mean, the only thing, the only job that uh, Mr. Chalmers is interested in is, uh, is, the, is the latest job. He doesn't want to keep doing the Shadow Treasurer's job. Everybody knows that he's already out there campaigning. Everybody knows that. But let me, let me, just, let me, just, say, let me just say again, our economy continues to grow. Many other economies around the world are shrinking. Uh, our economy, if you actually look at the international context and the global economic headwinds we're facing, the headwinds we're facing in the domestic economy, uh, the fact that our economy continues to grow is good news for the Australian people. Uh, the alternative with uh, Labor's high taxing socialist agenda would have been a weaker economy, fewer jobs, higher unemployment and lower wages. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. <coughs> Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government's sound budget and economic management is helping to strengthen support for problem gamblers, including through the recent announcement of the new National Self-Exclusion Register? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. And can I thank Senator Askew for her question on this really important issue that matters to all Australians, and that is gambling-related harm. And that is why this government is absolutely committed to providing the support to the almost 240,000 Australians who experience harm as a result of gambling. Uh, last week, uh, the government introduced legislation, which I'm pleased to say passed last night in the House of Representatives, to establish a national self-exclusion register for online wagering. This is a significant piece of legislation and demonstrates an absolute commitment to respond to the growing concerns in the community about the impacts and the high rate of gambling-related uh, harm caused specifically by online gambling. The register is a voluntary process uh, where an individual can ban themselves from uh, interactive wagering sites uh, across state boundaries in a, for periods ranging from three months to permanently. But it's really important because specifically this tool, this, this first of a kind in the world tool, enables a, a gambler who sees uh, the need to exclude themselves by a single action can actually have themselves deregistered from all sites, all gambling sites. Um, and as much as possible, we need to also make sure that, that our policies you know, allow, an Australia, allow Australians who love to have a punt to be able to continue to do so, but at the same time making sure that we have sensible and targeted measures to support gamblers who have and do face significant risks of harm. Um, the register will be available to around one million consumers who currently have online wagering accounts. Uh, and another very important feature of this particular uh, register is that the sector, the gambling sector, has been very, very engaged and has made significant contributions to the development of this register to ensure that it is going to be workable for all Australians. And to that end, I thank Wagering Australia and the wagering community for their very important interaction in developing this tool. Senator, to ask you a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate why the national self-exclusion register is necessary? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. 
Well, unfortunately, um, we have seen that there is a three times higher likelihood uh, of somebody who has an online uh, is an online gambler um, of having a problem with gambling than those that gamble by other means. And currently, there is no uniform way in which somebody who identifies, self-identifies as having a problem with online gambling, for them to be able to take the necessary action to exclude themselves uh, from uh, from websites. So that means, at the moment, those who are most vulnerable to having a, an issue with online uh, wagering uh, would have to individually go to every website where online wagering was available and exclude themselves one at a time. Obviously, this significantly undermines the effectiveness of something of an exclusion um, activity as a pro consumer protection tool. Um, so, by the introduction of this new measure, we seek to be able to streamline that process and give people who identify as having a problem easy Order. access to a solution. Askius, final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. How will this legislation help participants who are experiencing gambling-related harm? Senator Ruston. Thank you very much. Well, um, clearly, this chamber would be well aware of the, the potential impacts of, uh, of gambling-related harm and the adverse impacts that can have on people's lives. Whether, I mean, the obvious one being financial well-being, but it then uh, can, can also impact on self-esteem, on relationships, on work performance, housing situations, and of course, physical and mental health. Last week, the government actually released a baseline study into online wagering that was undertaken by the Australian Institute of Family Studies. And some of the key findings from that study show that participants reported having 2.3 uh, wagering accounts, so an individual who, uh, who had an online wagering account was likely to have 2.3. 83% uh, of participants uh, placed bets online using portable devices such as a mobile phone, and 52% of respondents were classified as being at risk. Um, the National Self-Exclusion Register is a very significant measure in helping people Order. to deal Senator with these Rustin. issues. Senator Bernardi. <laughs> I'll wait till you hear the question. <laughs> My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Minister, socialism is a political and economic <laughs> ideology that rejects the free market and supports bigger taxes bigger government, central planning, government price fixing and the nationalisation of industry. Can the minister— Order. Order. I'm order. Order. Can I— <laughs> This, on a point of order, Senator Cormann. M Mr President, I feel like it's an important question for me to be able to hear, and I couldn't actually hear the question. I, I will ask a courtesy— I will ask a courtesy to be extended to Senator Bernardi on the day of his valedictory speech. And for the question to be heard in silence. Senator Bernardi. I should start again. Would you reset the uh, I think Mr. you can President. keep going, Senator no, Bernardi. I think we've got the gist. Can oh, the, the, minister... the minister genuinely says he didn't hear it, so okay. you have to start again, Senator Bernardi. Minister, socialism is a political and economic ideology that rejects the free market, supports bigger taxes, bigger government, central planning, government price fixing and the nationalisation of industry. Can the minister please explain why the government hasn't implemented such policies? And can he share with the Senate any examples of the consequences of the socialist policy agenda and where they have been implemented? Want <laughs> Senator, on, on a point of order, Senator, Senator Wong. Mr President, much as uh, you know, I have affection for Senator Bernardi, I do wonder whether that is actually something this minister can respond to. I mean, is it, is it, is it really a matter of cover policy? On, on the point of uh, I'll have order, a drink about it if you want, but really. and then I'll hear Senator Cormann on the point of order. On, on the point of order, I believe that senators' understanding orders are uh, able to ask questions of ministers in relation to past public statements, and I advise the senator that I've made past public statements about how bad <laughs> socialism is and uh, the impact of socialism on people in the economy. Um, questions are also be allowed to be addressed as to the intent of the government, and particularly the last part of the question was definitely in order. And as I've done before, when some oh, sorry, Senator Wish Wilson on the point of order. I didn't see Point of you. order, uh, President. I was wondering if that question should be directed to Senator Canavan, the Minister for Nationalising Coal-Fired Power Stations. Senator, Senator Wish Wilson. <laughs> on the on the point of order. Um, on the point of order, um, Senator 
Senator Wong is correct. The statement wasn't referenced. However, the concluding part of the question did talk about the government's intent, which is within the remit of question time. And in the past, where some parts of questions have not technically been in order, I've invited ministers to respond to the extent that they are. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I mean, the reason we uh, fight socialism and support uh, policies supporting individual freedom, free enterprise, reward for effort, encouraging people to stretch themselves uh, and indeed uh, have a goal, is because we understand that socialism makes people poorer, will make communities weaker, will make countries weaker. Whereas, of course, uh, our uh, policy agenda in pursuit of the you know, policy supporting individual freedom, uh, free enterprise, reward for effort, encouraging people to stretch themselves, take risks, have a go, uh, underpinned by a social safety net, we understand that that is the proven way to uh, lift living standards for uh, individual Australians, for families, their communities and indeed for our country as a whole, as it has in countries around the world. And I, as, a, as somebody who's grown up in Europe, let me tell you, I know the ultimate case study which has proven that socialism leads to misery and poverty. And in fact, that case study is none other uh, than the, uh, the global city of Berlin. The global city of Berlin. Berlin is the ultimate case study. You had three million people side by side in 1949, starting with the same challenges, same opportunities, same demography, same climate, same everything. On one side, socialism, the uh, lowest common denominator, uh, seeking to achieve equality of outcomes. People wanted to get out as fast as they could. The state had to build a wall in order to try and keep people in. Order. The state started to shoot people at the wall to try and keep people in because people wanted to get into the part of Berlin that, had is... free, that promoted freedom, free enterprise, reward for effort, and a lifting in living, living standards. And indeed, of course, uh, on the western side, uh, people were able to observe das Wirtschaftswunder, uh, the absolute, uh, the absolute uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, massive economic growth uh, wonder uh, that was, of course, uh, on, on, achieved on the back of free market policy uh, underpinned by a social safety net. And in countries around the world, it is very clear that socialism harms people, whereas freedom, of Order. course, promotes success. Order. Order. Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Well, yes, I note the minister mentioned socialism, and I remind him that socialism's close comrade is Marxism, which paradoxically uses divisive identity politics as a means to reduce social cohesion, to overthrow capitalism. Minister, what is the government doing to save Australians from the Marxist agenda? <laughs> Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. We'll continue to fight for freedom, uh, Mr. Mr. President. I mean, Marxism is essentially just socialism on steroids. Marxism is socialism on steroids. It is a failed ideology. Uh, it is an ideology that has led people in countries around the world where it's been applied into poverty and misery. Uh, because you know, any policy agenda that seeks to pursue equality of outcomes necessarily leads people to uh, equally mediocre outcomes. Whereas, of course, uh, uh, our policy agenda pursuing freedom and free enterprise, uh, smaller government, lower taxes, is, a, is an agenda that incentivizes people to be the best they can be. So that, uh, and that, of course, more successful Australians in our context will lead to a more successful Australia, which is better for all Australians indeed. So we will continue to work very hard to ensure that Australians today and into the future have the best possible opportunity to get ahead, uh, because we understand that the, uh, maximising the success of every individual Australian helps to provide better Order, opportunity Senator for all Coleman, Australians. time for the answer has expired. Senator Bernardi, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. And this is a very specific question, so I would ask the minister to be directly relevant to it. <laughs> is the minister aware of any senator who stands approximately six feet five inches tall and has devoted their political career to railing against socialism and Marxism? If so, what would he say to that senator right now? <laughs> senator Bernardi. Sorry, Senator Cormann. Well, um, <laughs> Mr. President, the first thing, the, the first, the first thing I would say, the first thing I would say, Mr. President, I once, I once knew a guy, I, I once, I once knew a guy who was in the Liberal Party party room promoting a, a great uh, conservative free market agenda, but sadly he left us. Sadly he left us. But I feel, I feel, I feel like that in more recent time. Uh, that uh, very fine senator for the great state of South Australia has been coming back closer to the bosom uh, of uh, the broader Liberal Party family, 
And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased about that. I'm very pleased about that. But let me just, in, uh, you know, seriously, in closing my response to this question, uh, Senator Bernardi has made a fine contribution. I uh, very much valued his contribution inside the Liberal Party. I was disappointed when he chose to leave the Liberal Party. But of course, uh, you know, having made the decision that he's made now, uh, I'm sure that all senators will join me in wishing Senator uh, Bernardi all the best of success Order. into the future. We've all Senator enjoyed the sparring. Coleman. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. According to the 2018 Order. PISA results released overnight, Australia has recorded our worst ever international test results in reading, maths and science. Earlier this week, the Minister for Education said that government reforms will lift student outcomes. I ask when. The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Pratt uh, for her question in relation to uh, uh, school results. And, uh, and indeed, uh, Mr. President, if I take one of the interjections before, I'm sure that uh, uh, I'm sure that Senator Bernardi would concur that uh, that the results of the PISA survey are very disappointing, are unacceptable, and that we do need to see we do need to see uh, that results in relation to school education improve across this country. Our children deserve world-leading education, giving them skills to thrive, and they deserve strong literacy, maths and science skills fundamental to their success. And these results and I, I'll, I'll take Senator O'Neill's inter interjection there in relation to funding, because that is, of course, where the Labor Party inevitably go, inevitably go in relation to funding. Mr President, as this chamber has debated endlessly over the years and is well known, school funding in Australia stands at record levels. Record levels. The debate that must be had in Australia is about how we get better results from the record investment that is occurring. In fact, let me quote from the Australian Financial Review today, in which, uh, in which the education writer states that the PISA Order, results Senator have shown a collapse despite government spending on schools hitting nearly $58 billion a year, 70 per cent more than when Senator, global, global school testing started. So, Mr President, in the life of the PISA results, we have seen a 70 per cent increase in funding and yet a decline in relation to performance. That is why our government wants to Order. see the states and territories next week and at the COAG Education Order. Council. Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. Senator Pratt, on a point of order. My question was very clearly when. That is why I'm interjecting. My point of order is to relevance. He has not once mentioned any time scale in his answer and not come to the relevant point of time in my question. Um, Senator Pratt, I, I'm glad that you, you felt the urge to confess your error there about the interjections. They are always disorderly. Um, I was having trouble hearing the last part of the minister's answer. Um, I've allowed you to emphasise that part of the question, but I do believe the minister was being directly relevant to the earlier part of the question you read out, and I cannot instruct him how to answer a question. I've given you the opportunity to emphasise part of it. The minister does, however, have six seconds left uh, in his time to answer. I hope I can hear it. Senator Birmingham. And that is why next week the states and territories need to agree with the reforms the Commonwealth is asking them to pursue and get on with it, Mr. President. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. Mr. President, our school children have fallen around a year behind in basic subjects, including reading, maths and science, according to data from the 2018 PISA International Students' Tests. Can the minister confirm that under the Morrison government's watch, Australia's performance in maths is no better than the global average for the first time ever. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, as I've already said, I, I describe as the Minister for Education has, as the Prime Minister has, these results as completely unacceptable. That's why indeed I was, indeed I was, Senator Watt. Order. Indeed I was. And the reforms that the reforms that Mr Tian is taking to the COAG Education Council next week to try to get them to speed up implementation of those reforms are reforms that we were 
taking to that council when I was the minister. Reforms that the panel led by David Gonski and distinguished educators around the country identified needed to happen to make sure, to make sure that we actually use the money effectively. And that is precisely what we expect the states and territories to do. Use that record funding effectively, implement the reform agenda, our government commission, get on with its implementation so we can turn around these results. Order. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given Senator Birmingham was the Minister for Education during the period these tests were taken, does he take responsibility for the worst ever results in reading, maths and science? When will the Morrison government finally implement a plan to turn around an education system delivering some of the worst ever results? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, we have a plan, and we are trying to get the states and territories to implement it as fast as we possibly can. Oh, Senator Wong, it's someone else's fault she interjects. Senator Wong seems to completely ignore the reality that the Commonwealth government doesn't run a single school in the country. We don't run a single school in the country, Senator Wong. What we do is try to actually Order. drag, drag recalcitrant states the and territories as they are at times, kicking and screaming, to deliver reform faster, better to apply the types of measures that are necessary to declutter the curriculum, to get back to basics around maths and English and reading skills, to deliver in terms of the modern techniques that need to be applied around properly measuring and assessing Senator learning progressions and making sure that we actually Senator look at guaranteeing that each student in the classroom is learning effectively, that they are growing in each year of their learning and that we are actually addressing these problems, which have been evident for many years. We commissioned the research to deliver Order. the reforms and we want to hold the Order. states and territories accountable Time to make those reforms. Has inspired. Senator O'Neill, Order. Order. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Canavan. Can the Minister outline how the Liberal National Government's sound budget and economic management is strengthening vital infrastructure investments to support Australian families and businesses, including in my home state of South Australia? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Antich for his question and his keen interest in seeing better infrastructure built in his home state. Mr President, there is one role that government can play in our economy, and that is building infrastructure around our country. And that's why we are managing uh, the nation's budget carefully. That's why we are making sure we're careful spending other people's money so that we can spend record amounts of investment in infrastructure to build a better country. That is why, Mr President, we are spending over or investing over $100 billion in 130 projects, creating over 80,000 jobs across Australia, and lots of that is happening in South Australia too. Now, Mr. President, in South Australia, in South Australia, this in this year's budget, uh, an additional $2.6 billion was allocated to infrastructure projects, part, part of the broader infrastructure package for South Australia. That package includes $4.5 billion to update, upgrade, sorry, the North-South corridor. It includes $361 million for the Urban Congestion Fund just in South Australia. It includes $260 million for the Rural Road Safety Package. It includes $220 million for the Gawler rail, rail Line Infrastructure Upgrade as well. Mr. President, that is just in our existing portfolio package. But, Mr. President, we are also making sure that we can bring forward this investment to, to as soon as possible to help create jobs in our economy and get our states moving, including South Australia. So that's why last month, Mr. President, we announced that we'd bring forward $78 million of infrastructure spending in the Adelaide and the metro region of South Australia, and we'd also bring forward $250 million of projects in regional South Australia as well. Mr. President, they include, as I mentioned, the rural roads program that we're funding, bringing forward uh, funding on the Victor, Victor Harbour Road and the Horrocks Cor Corridor as well. And all of these investments will create jobs, opportunity and build a better South Australia. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Minister, how is the Liberal National Government addressing infrastructure needs of South Australia through its record investment? 
Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, as we finish this year and go into 2020, 2020 will be a year of building infrastructure in South Australia. We have 17 projects, 17 infrastructure projects across South Australia starting next year, and that'll be very exciting uh, for those Australians living there. We've got next year starting. Uh, some of those 17 projects include $200 million being invested to duplicate a bridge in Port Augusta between Mackay Street and Burgoyne Street in Port Augusta, a big investment there. It includes starting the $143 million of investments on the Rural Roads Safety Package, making sure we can put in place more overtaking lanes, which are very important on rural roads, to make sure we have safe outcomes. It also includes a $90 million project uh, at Port Wakefield to duplicate the Port Wakefield Highway as well. Mr. President, all of these projects will help support the South Australian economy. They are a sign of a government that has the money and funding to invest in infrastructure and create jobs in South Australia. Senator Antic, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, what are the benefits from the Liberal National Government's record infrastructure investment for my home state of South Australia? Senator Canavan. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, as I have mentioned, many of the projects across South Australia, the South Australian economy is also in the unique position of being able to benefit from the broader infrastructure we are spending around the country. Because, Mr. President, uh, uh, as we all know, as many of us would know, as I know Senator Antich knows well, uh, the South Australian economy is where we produce a lot of our steel. A lot of our steel is produced at Wyala in South Australia, and the federal government has supported the continuing, continuing production of steel in Wyala. And now we can reap the benefits of making sure that Australian steel can build Australian infrastructure projects. So, Mr. President, on the inland rail, which we're building uh, not in South Australia but between Melbourne to Brisbane, we are using Wyala steel on that project, supporting South Australia's jobs, making sure that we spread the benefits of our infrastructure boom right around the country. So, Mr. President, already 38,000 tonnes of Wyala steel are being used to upgrade the inland rail in western New South Wales. We hope more will be used as this project rolls out and supports jobs in South Australia. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer the Minister to the report, Liberal MP Lou, linked to donor at Centre of Cash Drop Inquiry, published in the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald and The Age today. Bryson, the company subject to a drug trafficking and money laundering probe by the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, donated $105,000 to the Liberal Party just months earlier. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to investigate links between the Minister for Health and the member for Chisholm and Bryson? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, all political uh, donations uh, by, uh, received by candidates or political parties obviously have to be received and declared consistent with our relevant laws. Uh, that is a responsibility for political uh, parties and individual candidates. I'm not aware of the, um, you know, the circumstances she's describing. I'll take uh, on notice whether there's anything uh, else that I can, that I can add. Uh, to that answer, but uh, again, uh, let me just say what I've said on a number of occasions before. Don't always believe what you read in newspapers. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The member for Chisholm has said that, and I quote, I helped Bryce Sun talk to ministers. I helped them to invite the minister to come to their launch, Greg Hunt. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to determine Ms Liu's knowledge of the activities of Bryce Sun? a company subject to a drug trafficking and money laundering probe by the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The first Order. point I would make is that there's nothing unusual about uh, ministers being invited to attend events. Uh, I'm not uh, aware of the circumstances I'm not aware of the, circ the specific circumstances that Senator Kitchen uh, is describing there, and I'll take that question on notice. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Bryson CEO Charles Brent has said that, and I quote, Gladys did a very good job. She was instrumental in helping us get access, like any good lobbyist would, and that was her job. At the time, she was doing fundraising for the Liberal Party. Can the Prime Minister guarantee that no member of the Liberal Party was aware of the source of the $105,000 donation donated to the party by Bryson? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Again, I'm not aware. I mean, obviously, all uh, political parties uh, have to uh, receive and declare uh, political donations uh, 
consistent with our electoral laws. That is uh, what I'm confident the uh, Liberal Party does, and I would like to think all other political parties order. do. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Order. Um, I'll take the interjection, order. Mr President. It would be helpful if you wouldn't if you go to the point of order, <laughs> Senator Wong. Go on, let me. <laughs> Senator Wong on a point of order. Um, Mr President, uh, this is an important matter. It is not just a matter of what the donations laws are. This goes to whether the Prime Minister is aware of any of his ministers or members being aware that the donation came from a company that was under investigation uh, by the AFP and the Criminal Intelligence Commission. And I'd ask the minister on this issue if he would be directly relevant to that point. Um, on the point of order, the minister had previously spoke about matters that I did believe directly relevant and taken them on notice. He'd been speaking for 17 seconds here. I was going to give him the opportunity to continue his answer. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. I mean, it's, I'll just make a statement of the obvious. Obviously, I'm not aware of what other people might or might not be aware, uh, and I've made that very clear, and which is why I've taken relevant parts of the question in relation to circumstances that are being described that I'm not aware of on notice. But I just make the general point uh, that, uh, of course, all parties and all candidates have to comply with our electoral laws uh, when it comes uh, to receiving uh, and declaring uh, political donations. Senator and I Coleman. ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. And Mr. President. Senator Coleman. Mr. President, pursuant to Standing Order 190, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. It has been brought to my attention that yesterday during a press conference with the Shadow Attorney General and others, the Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Keneally, has made two false accusations which I would like to directly address and refute. The issue relates to commitments I made on behalf of the government in the Senate about 12 months ago during the consideration of the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Assistance and Access Act 2018. I delivered on those commitments made to the Senate, uh, to the letter and in full. Yet Senator Keneally yesterday and other Labor members and senators in similar terms in recent weeks um, have falsely asserted that I did not deliver on those commitments. I pride myself on uh, delivering on my commitments, so I will address the false accusations made in turn. This is specifically what Senator Keneally said yesterday, and I'm quoting her. The leader of the government in the Senate, Matthias Cormann, uh, stood on the floor of the Senate and gave an assurance that the government would pass those very amendments when the parliament resumed in February. Senator Keneally has asserted here that I gave an assurance that the government would pass further amendments to the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Assistance and Access Act 2018 when the Parliament resumed in February. This is false. The Hansard clearly and accurately shows that what I actually committed to do on 6 December 2018 on that point was that, and I'm quoting, the government has agreed to facilitate consideration of these amendments in the new year in government business time. The government did facilitate consideration of these amendments in the new year in government business time, namely on 13 February 2019, the government introduced the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2019 into the Senate. During the debate on that bill on 14 February 2019, the opposition moved its various amendments to the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Assistance and Access Act 2018 it wanted to move. And these amendments were duly considered by the Senate during government business time, 100 per cent as promised. This takes me to Senator Keneally's second false assertion when she said, and I'm quoting, those amendments the government has refused now for 12 months to bring back to the parliament. In the meantime, in the intervening months, while the government, in order to avoid having any amendments put forward, have instituted a series of reviews. This is also false and misleading. Firstly, at the instigation of the Labour Party, the government on 6 December last year agreed to a second reading amendment to ensure the PJCIS conduct, and I'm quoting, conduct a review of the operation of the amendments made by this bill and report on that review by 3 April 2019. The government agreed to this in good faith at the request of the Labour Party and so did the Senate. In its April 2019 report, the PJCIS made a bipartisan request for a bipartisan request for further time, and you know, Senator Keneally doesn't understand about the importance of bipartisanism uh, inside the PJCIS, clearly. In its April 2019 report, the PJCIS made a bipartisan request for, and I'm quoting, further time for the PJCIS to complete its third review of the legislation. Again, the government acted entirely in good faith by acting on the bipartisan request from the PJCIS. That is, the second review was a result of a Senate vote sought by Labour and supported by the government. The further reviews are as a result of a bipartisan request 
by the PJCIS for an extension or are required by law in the case of the independent national security legislation monitor review. It is important to understand the timeline. In passing the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Assistance and Access Bill 2018 last year, the Senate agreed to, and I quote, to refer the amendments to be made by this bill to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to conduct a review of the operation of the amendments made by this bill and to report on that review by 3 April 2019. Separately, on 27 March 2019, the PJCIS referred the Act to the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor for review and report by 1 March 2020. That's the PJCIS, including the Labour Party. The PJCIS advised that it would consider any findings or recommendations in its own review of the Act. So that is why, on 3 April 2019, the PJCIS made further recommendations following the second review of the Assistance and Access Act. These recommendations related to the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Review, resourcing for oversight bodies and requesting further time for the PJCIS to complete its third review of the legislation. On 9 April, the Chair of the PJCIS, Mr Andrew Heisty MP, on behalf of the Committee, wrote to the Prime Minister requesting that legislation be introduced to defer the Committee's reporting date on the Assistance and Access Act to 30 September 2020, at the request of the PJCIS the bipartisan request, including the Labour Party of the PJCIS. On 17 October 2019, the government published its response, accepting those recommendations. On the same day, the government introduced the Assistance and Access Amendments Review Bill, which defers the date for the PJCIS to complete its third review of the legislation until 30 September 2020, as requested by the PJCIS, including the Labour Party. It is important to ensure that the independent national security legislation monitor and the committee have the time they need to complete comprehensive and thorough examinations of the Assistance and Access Act and its impacts, including time, to engage with industry and the public. Finally, I also said on behalf of the government that we supported in principle all amendments to this bill that are consistent with PJCIS recommendations. That remains our position. When the PJCIS recommendations come forward, we will act on them as we always do. The reason I put all this on the record is because ever since Senator Keneally has joined the PJCIS, she has sought to politicise what, what always must be a bipartisan Order. committee acting in our national interest. Order. She has made false and inaccurate accusations and assertions, and she has sought to play politics with our national security. Australians should be very concerned about Senator Keneally's constant propensity for political stunts involving our national security. Moreover, this is yet another inappropriate attempt. This is, this is just another inappropriate attempt uh, to weaken our national security laws and to somehow create the impression that the government did not uh, f follow through on the commitments we made when we followed through on those commitments to the letter, as we always do. Senator Wong. Um, Mr President, um, I'd seek leave to make a very short response, and then I flag and I trust that Senator Cormann, since he's been given leave, will give the, the Senator Keneally the courtesy that he's been demonstrated. I simply want to make two points. The first is <laughs> the Leader of the Government and the Senate requested time by leave to respond to what he suggested were um, he'd been uh, misrepresented. He's used that time to get to a personal attack on the motivations of the deputy leader of the Senate, in the, uh, the deputy leader of the opposition in the Senate. That is not appropriate. That is not appropriate. And, and if he's going to use um, the courtesies of the Senate to do that, he should be upfront about doing so. The second point I would make: the second point, you impugned her motivation. Absolutely, as a personal attack, and that was not warranted. The second point I would make. It is all very well for the Leader of the Government to come in here and now lord the bipartisanship of the PJCIS. The people who, just, who sought to undermine the bipartisanship of the PJCIS were the Coalition and, in particular, his mate Peter Dutton, for whom he couldn't count the numbers. So do not, do not come in here and cloak yourselves in bipartisanship when it suits you. Can I remind senators—I'm going to make a point to remind senators— all right, Senator Cormann, I'm going to... I, I'll just make very clear that I was misrepresented by Senator Keneally yesterday, and I made an explanation as to why I was misrepresented. Okay, so can I, I'm going to rule on this. Standing Order 190 for those listening in the chamber. By leave of the Senate, a Senate may explain matters of a personal nature, although there is no question before the Senate, but such matters may not be debated. Uh, in my view, Senator Cormann, that contribution got into the realm of debating. Um, Senator Wong, I gave you 
leave or I let you speak to that issue, but I ask senators that this particular standing order works on the basis of leave, and therefore I believe it needs to be sort of more strictly adhered to. Senator Keneally. Mr. President, given your ruling, I seek to leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. Well, it does seem to suit the government to throw around the word bipartisanship when it suits them and to disregard it when it doesn't. Rest assured, Senator Cormann, I do understand the bipartisan nature of the PJCIS. I understood it when Minister Dutton described the PJCIS as just another committee. Exactly. I understood it when the government rejected the bipartisan recommendations of the PJCIS when it came to the temporary exclusion orders legislation Sorry. earlier this year. I understood it when the Labor opposition moved those bipartisan recommendations of the PJCIS in relation to the temporary exclusion orders and government members voted against them, including the government members of the PJCIS who had actually endorsed those recommendations. And I understand the bipartisan nature of the PJCIS when it was last year, in a hurried and harried fashion, asked to curtail its consideration of these encryption laws and asked to deliver a set of recommendations, which it did, which it did. And I understand and make very clear that you stood here, we all watched you, and said the words, I also confirm the government has agreed to facilitate consideration of these amendments in the new year. You did say that, and you gave, what you did there was indicate to everyone that if we voted for this bill without amendments, if we, the Labour Party, gave up the right to move amendments in that legislation, that they would be moved and they would be supported, because the word facilitate indicates that. And the Order. minister is taking, I will take the minister's interjections, because this goes to the very point of the secret deal that has been struck today by Senator Lambie and the government. And I hope somewhere in this building Senator Lambie is watching and listening to this debate, because the fact that Minister Cormann has, come, has had his, quite frankly, feelings hurt, has had to come in here into this chamber and argue about whether or not the word facilitate means support or not. That is exactly the type of loophole that they will rely upon in whatever secret agreement they have struck with Senator Lambie. And this is why Senator Lambie should be very wary of whatever the secret deal that she has struck with this government. Because as long as it remains secret, she will struggle to hold them account. And once it becomes public, it becomes clear they find ways to wiggle out of the accountability and the commitments that they have made. So, I thank the minister for taking the time of the Senate to make these points in this way, because all he has managed to do is highlight the sensitivity the government has over the fact that the encryption laws remain unamended. They are and remain the subject of extraordinary concern by the technology sector in this country. They are curtailing jobs and economic growth. And as the House Judiciary Committee of the U.S. Congress has written to Minister Dutton to express its serious concern that the laws as they currently stand do not conform to the Cloud Act. That's the Clarifying the Legal Overseas Use of Data Act that would allow our law enforcement agencies to have much quicker access to data overseas to solve crimes. That's what is happening here. And let everyone who is listening and watching make no mistake that that is why we have moved these amendments. Clearly, the government feels sensitivity to it. But we will continue with the support of the tech sector in this country, and I hope the support of the crossbench, to pursue, to pursue, to pursue this amendment in the new year. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Senator McKim. Leave to make a one-minute statement. Is leave granted? Yeah. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McKinnon. Well, thank you very much. And look, I can place on the record. Thank you to, the, uh, to Senator Cormann for placing that information before um, the Senate, and um, thank you to Senator Keneally for um, her um, response. I, I can confirm that um, the Greens are very predisposed to supporting the amendments that Labor has put forward. But I want to place something on the record about the Labor Party. I mean, fair dinkum, fair dinkum, the Labor Party voted 
for the very legislation that they're now proposing to amend. And they voted for it despite the warnings of the tech sector in Australia. So when Senator Keneally gets up and says she hopes she has the support of the crossbench, that is an effective attempt to rewrite history in relation to these disgraceful amendments that dealt a body blow to the tech centre in this country, and Labor was culpable for supporting them. And I believe we would have had the numbers to knock them off in the Senate hadn't Labor gone, had Labor not gone all week and allowed, rolled over and allowed the government to tickle its tummy. Thank you, Senator McKim. So we'll now move on to motions to take note. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Watt? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Gallagher and Walsh. Uh, well, another day and more shocking new figures about the state of the Australian economy under this government. The government that went to the election promising the Australian people that it would deliver a strong economy and rising living standards, and month after month after month we see that those promises to the Australian people are broken by this government. This is a government that says that it's, it's, it prides itself on being strong economic managers. They say that the difference between them and this side of the chamber is that they can deliver good economic management. Well, where is it? Where is it? Month after month, we try to find signs that under this government's stewardship, the Australian economy is in good shape, as they promised they would do, but month after month, we see more and more figures showing how much the Australian economy is floundering uh, as a result of this government's lack of leadership. Let's have a look at the figures that have come out today. So today, the new figures uh, show that economic growth in this country went backwards compared to the last quarter. So I take Senator Scar's earlier interjection, interjection where he says that the economy is growing. The latest figures show that economic growth went backwards compared to the last quarter. Annual growth is only at 1.7 per cent, barely growing at all, still has a one in front of it, well below the government's forecast of 2.75 per cent. This government's last budget was predicated on an assumption that the economy would grow at the rate of 2.75 per cent over this financial year. It's currently running at 1.7 per cent. The tax cuts that this government again went to the election on, they were the centrepiece of this government's economic agenda. They were the thing that was going to get the economy moving, according to the government. Well, now we've got the Australian Bureau of Statistics saying that the reduction to tax payable did not translate to a rise in discretionary spending or put in plain language, the tax cuts didn't work. The tax cuts have not got people spending money in the way that the government said that they would do, and that's reflected in the poor retail figures that we see. That's re reflected in a whole range of other data that shows how badly the economy is performing under this government. And that's, of course, backed up by wages, where this government, under this government's stewardship, we have wages growing at the lowest rate we have seen in Australian history. Since records began on this subject you know, decades ago, we have never seen wages growing so poorly as they are right now under this government. And it's no wonder then that the Reserve Bank has recently just made the point that lower wage rises have become the new normal. That's what we've got, that's what the Australian people have got to thank this government for. Six years of office in their third term, and they've delivered a new normal when it comes to wages. And that is lower wage rises. Congratulations. I hope you're giving yourselves all a pat on the back, you good economic managers. You people who said that you needed to win the election to keep the economy strong, give yourselves a pat on the back. You've delivered a new normal being lower wage rises. And of course, that's not really any surprise because we've had uh, the leader of the government in the Senate, Minister Cormann, the Minister for Finance, I might say, for the last six years. The entire time this government has been in office, Minister Cormann has held the purse strings as the Minister for, for Finance, and what he's got to show for it is economic growth going backwards compared to the last quarter, uh, tax cuts that aren't working, uh, and the worst wages growth on record. Uh, but I think Minister Cormann would be actually quite okay with all that because, of course, we know um, that he was caught out on film saying that keeping the wages low in this country is a deliberate design feature uh, of the government's economic policy. What kind of politician? would actually get into office uh, to deliberately keep wages low. That's the kind of, that's the kind of attitude we have from this government. 
Uh, and it's, I mean, that we all know on this side of the house that that's what this government is about. And today, when Minister Coleman was asked questions about this, you would think that on another day, when we have poor economic data coming out about this government, you might see a bit of humility from this government. But no, not from Minister Cormann, not from this Liberal national government who said that they were going to keep the economy strong. They don't know the meaning of the word humility. Rather than being a bit humble, we see more arrogance from this government in saying that everything is going hunky-dory, everything's going swimmingly, everything's going really, really well in the Australian economy. In fact, they might as well say that Australians have never had it so good. How arrogant! How arrogant of this government that won an election uh, to its great surprise and is now presiding over poor economic growth, tax cuts that aren't working, and the lowest wages growth that we've Thank ever you, seen. Thank you, Senator. What your time has expired, Senator Scarf. Madam Deputy President, the one thing I have learned in my over five months here is when the Labor Party talks about economic data, you should always go to the original document. Always go to the original document and read what the actual facts say. Read what the facts are. And the facts of the matter are. Excuse me? Order. I'll take the interjection from the. Uh, well. Order. Senator Scar, Senator, Senator Carr is on uh, perhaps a different philosophical bent. <laughs> Household disposable income has in fact increased, has increased in this country by 2.5 per cent, the fastest quarterly rise in a decade, with the ABS saying it was driven by a decline in income tax payable and interest paid on dwellings, as well as continued rises in the compensation of employees. That's what the ABS has said. Not what Senator Watt has said, but what the ABS has said. I'll say it again. Driven by a decline in income tax payable and interest paid on dwellings, as well as continued rises in the compensation of employees. Because, as Senator Cormann said, as Senator Cormann said it is up to the Australian people how they decide, how they decide to spend or save their tax cuts. But at least this side of the chamber gave them the choice. At least we gave them the choice. We gave them the tax cuts so they could make the decision as to what was in the best interest of their families and their households. We gave them the choice, Senator Watt. We gave them the choice. Let me quote what uh, Mr Philip Lowe, Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, said in a release just yesterday. The US-China trade and technology disputes continue to affect international trade flows and investment as businesses scale back spending plans because of the uncertainty. As Senator Cormann has frequently said in this place, this economy is facing difficult international issues, difficult international issues that are not of its making. And notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that, and notwithstanding the fact that countries like Germany, the United Kingdom, South Korea, Singapore have all experienced negative economic growth this year, negative economic growth this year, Australia is still producing positive economic growth. Notwithstanding those headwinds, there is still positive economic growth. We have maintained our AAA credit rating, and we're only one of 10 economies around the world to do that. An outstanding performance. An outstanding performance. What are other people saying other than those on the other side of the chamber in the opposition? Seddon Poor said recently the outlook for the Australian economy was sound. Deloitte said the Australian economy is picking up with momentum. The IMF and the OECD are forecasting Australia to grow faster in 2020 than any other G7 nation. Faster than any other G7 nation. And the Reserve Bank of Australia has said the economy has reached a gentle turning point. A gentle turning point. And to go on in terms of the Reserve Bank of Australia's commentary, the central scenario is for growth to pick up gradually to around 3 per cent in 2021. The low level of interest rates, recent tax cuts, recent tax cuts opposed by those opposite, ongoing spending on infrastructure, the upswing in housing prices and a brighter outlook for the resources sector should all support growth. So it is a positive story, and Australia is doing remarkably well remarkably well, notwithstanding the headwinds on an international basis. What else have we heard today during question time? The Canberra bubble is alive and well. The Canberra bubble is alive as well. Deputy President, eight out of, eight out of 12 Queensland senators 
Eight out of 12 Queensland senators supported the legislation in relation to repairing the Medivac scheme earlier today. Eight out of 10. Representing the will of the Queensland Parliament. Representing the will of the Queensland people, I should say. We heard their voice loud and clear at the last election. We went to that election with a promise that we would deliver those amendments to the scheme. We delivered those today, and we can go back to the constituents of Queensland and say, job done today. Job done today. Eight out of 12 of the senators from Queensland supported that legislation. And we will remind Queenslanders that the four senators who did not, three out of 12 senators from Queensland, three from the Senator Australian Scar, Labor Party Senator, and one of the Senator Greens. Senator Scar, I remind you that the taking note question was um, questions to Senator Cormann about the economy from Senators Gallagher and Walsh. Now, I do appreciate it's a wide-ranging debate, but you do need to be speaking in broad terms, as you were in the beginning, about the economy. So please continue. Sure. And happy to end the note, happy to end my contribution by noting how sound a position the Australian economy is in, given the headwinds it's facing. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Pratt. Madam Deputy President, I also rise to take note this afternoon on questions uh, asked by Senator Gallagher and Senator Walsh to Senator Cormann on the economy. Time and time again, we come into this place. Uh, to talk to the government about the economy, and they pretend over and over again that everything is rosy. Uh, Senator Scar has just pointed the finger at the economic headwinds internationally, but we do not see time and time again an adequate response from this government, either in the way they answer questions or in the way they manage the economy. They come into this place uh, without a plan, without a plan to manage our Australian economy and to deal with these headwinds. We can see just this week uh, the media from the Australian Industry Group's uh, Australian performance on manufacturing. They have painted a very stark picture of the Australian economy, highlighting the lack of direction by the Morrison government to boost the economy. This is my own portfolio area, and you can see in manufacturing, and you can see the overall economic slowdown, the overall economic slowdown flowing down into different sectors of the economy. It shows that Australian manufacturing is indeed contracting. It is no longer growing. It is displaying its weakest performance since 2016. It shows weakening in building materials wood, furniture, metal products, machinery and equipment and paper, printing, textiles, clothing and paper. It also shows, very troubling, a drop in employment and wages. The Morrison government claimed that the economy would improve in the next quarter, and when Senator Cormann answers questions on the economy in question time today, he never adequately reflects on the, the negative state of the economy, what's actually uh, where the economy is in difficulty and why, because he wants to continue that things are rosy. He wants to continue to believe that our economy does not need government leadership and government intervention. He simply, through you, Madam Deputy President, uh, ignores the parlour state of the Australian economy. Yeah. But we can see the real growth figures that are well below average, well below forecast and well below what is needed to get wages growing again in our nation. Weak growth like this is inevitable. It is an absolute consequence of a government that has only a political strategy and not an economic plan. This government has ignored repeated calls not only from the opposition but also from the Reserve Bank, from other industry uh, players for proportionate and measured stimulus to support the economy. These calls have come from the Reserve Bank, the business community, economists, experts and indeed from the Labor Party. The government pretends when it, uh, boost, when it, when it put forward its mediocre uh, package on infrastructure 
that this was the kind of stimulus it was prepared to put forward. This is not economic stimulus. It is not adequate economic stimulus for our economy. It does not meet the test that these experts are calling for. It's high time that Senator Cormann, in this place, when uh, answering questions on the economy, when answering those questions or failing to answer, answer those questions, held his own government to account. Josh Fr Minister Frydenberg and Prime Minister Morrison, every time he comes in here, it is without a comprehensive plan to support our floundering economy, boost wages and lift productivity. There is simply nothing that this government speaks to when it comes in and answers questions on the economy that touches uh, even the sides of dealing with the real issues around boosting wages, lifting productivity and boosting the state of the Australian economy. We see in our nation, as we head towards Christmas, in the manufacturing sector, uh, very, very weak results. We see in that context uh, the order books are down and wages are down. There is a faster rate of contraction. Thank uh, you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Speaker, uh, President, sorry. <laughs> Um, look, I always find it interesting, though, when it comes to the economy, that it's never a New South Wales senator who asks a question. Because the last time the Labor Party was in power in New South Wales, the economy did nothing but tank. It continued to plummet to the bottom of all rankings, and it's taken a Liberal national government in New South Wales to bring it back up. So I did enjoy, though, the very first part of Senator Walsh's question when she said that during the September quarter the economy has grown. And I think ultimately she could have stopped there. But for some reason the Labor Party has a pathological need to talk our economy down. They're determined to see the negative in everything. Senator Watt, who comes in with the interjections and the smiles across the chamber, but really all he's looking for is to see the negative in anything, talking down the economy, talking down business, talking down all the states and all the work that's being done, even in his beloved Northern, Northern Australia. All of the work that the fabulous Minister Canavan is doing to support Northern, Northern Australia. And we can do that because we have an outstanding economic record and managing the economy is what this government does best. But let's talk about the fact that it is the 29th consecutive quarter of annual economic growth. But this is despite a raft of challenges, and Senator Scar was talking about some of the, uh, the international headwinds, but we also need to consider the ongoing international trade tensions. We have two of the largest economies in the world currently in a standoff, and this is obviously having an impact globally. We are in the centre of that with considerable trading partners in both of them, and therefore it is important that we walk an incredibly tight rope, and that is being done incredibly effectively by the Morrison government. We also see a housing market downturn. This is turning around, but that is uh, something that's occurred particularly in the major, in the major centres. But of course, one of the other significant impacts on our economy, something that I'm not sure those opposite fully understand, as Senator McKenzie has so eloquently explained, that prior to their newfound love of farming and drought, so very frequently were those words ever uttered by anyone opposite. So the drought is having a direct impact on our economy. But of course, this would be worse with $387 billion worth of new taxes that, as far as anyone can work out, are still Labor policy. I mean, no one really knows. We're not quite sure. I think poor uh, uh, the opposition leader is too busy looking over his shoulder at uh, the member for Maribyrnong, who I think wants his old job back. But, you know, the Australian uh, people and the economy have dodged a bullet by avoiding a Labor government. But what does this strong economy mean for everyday Australians? And when you talk about the drought, I'd just like to take a moment to look at some of the drought initiatives that, because of our economic condition and, and position, that we have been able to implement. Since the budget, there has been an additional $355 million 
to step up our drought response. And the last, latest announcement will triple this to more than $1 billion since the election, as well as more than $1 billion in new interest-free loans. So what does this mean to farmers? This means that the farmer household allowance can now be extended to support four years in every 10, not just four years over a lifetime. We've also seen an ability to relax the off-farm income and offset that and increase the cap to $100,000. This, this is ensuring that people are able to stay on their farms, keep food on their table as they endure one of the worst droughts in history, but in, in our recorded uh, in the last decade and century. But if you look also what's happened recently with the terrible bushfires, unlike those opposite, we have been able to offer an assistance package in line with the states of $48.25 million, a bushfire recovery package that is only possible because of a strong economy. Unlike opposite, and Senator Watt, unfortunately he's no longer here, would be, you know, fully understand the levy that had to be implemented to pay for the natural disaster recovery in Queensland because the government under Labor could not afford the package. Not over here. Over here, whilst you guys are opposite take drugs off the PBS because you can't afford to list anymore, we are listing one new drug every day. And that's how everyday Australians are benefiting from Thank a strong economy. Thank you, Senator economy. Hughes. Your time has expired. And I do remind you it is not appropriate to uh, refer to the fact that senators may have left the chamber. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, today Senator Cormann has been asked questions about slow economic growth, about low household spending, about low wages growth, about an economy that is in trouble. Uh, and his answers can basically be summarised as everything's going fine. There's nothing to see here. Uh, and the economy is just working fine. Thank you very much. Well, how insulting to the people who are doing it tough under this government's so-called economic leadership. Uh, how insulting to the people who are depending on this government to come up with an economic plan, to come up with a strong economy. Uh, and how insulting to the people who listened to the government three months ago when we saw the last set of figures of slow economic growth. Uh, and when people were told by this government that things would improve next time. Well, this is next time, uh, and it, things haven't improved. Uh, and that is a big problem for the people who are depending on this government to deliver a stronger economy. The economy is not working fine for everyday Australians. Uh, the economy is not working just fine for the 1.9 million Australians who are looking for work or for more work. Uh, it is not working fine for those hard-working Australians who haven't had a decent pay rise under this government, who haven't had a decent pay rise in seven years. Uh, and the economy is not working just fine for the parents who are making tough decisions, tough decisions about whether to pay their bills or whether to pay their rent, uh, and tough decisions at this time of year about whether they might be able to afford to take the family out or whether they need to save that money to spend it on Christmas presents for their children. The Prime Minister has said that the harder you work, the better you do. Well, people are working hard. People are working as hard as they can. And actually, it is this government that is asleep at the wheel. So let's take a look at this government's record on the economy, because their record is nothing short of lazy. During their seven years in power, this third-term government has been overseeing the worst economic performance since the global financial crisis. Let's not forget that Prime Minister Scott Morrison was the Treasurer for three years, uh, and he is all over this economic uh, outcome for the country. And what we've seen uh, is declining living standards under this government. We've seen household debt that is at record highs. And let's think about what that means for people. That means that people are struggling. They're doing it tough uh, and they're very much at risk of going under. 
Under this government, we've got 1.9 million Australians who are underemployed or unemployed. Uh, at the same time, as just recently, this government is proposing cuts to New Start. We've got business investment that is the lowest since the 1990s recession. Uh, we've got wages that are growing at just one sixth the pace of profits. Um, and uh, along with this government's uh, extraordinary economic uh, management record, we've got a doubling of gross national debt, uh, which has hit $400 billion for the first time in our history. Uh, and now uh, the most recent record is yet another quarter of slow economic growth, just 0.4 per cent uh, in the last quarter. Uh, and let's think about this government's record on wages. Uh, because this government's record on wage growth is the worst for any government uh, ever. Uh, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be getting any better um, if you listen to the Governor of the Reserve Bank, who says that wages growth is subdued and is expected to, re to remain at its current rate for some time yet. Well, that statement is not going to be very good news for the millions of Australians who are waiting for a wage rise, who are waiting for this economy to pick up so that they can do better for their families, so that they can do better in their communities. Uh, and this weak wage growth, of course, is contributing uh, to Australia's economic woes, because when people can't uh, get the wages that they need, then they can't spend in their local community and the economy slows even further. Uh, and that's the pattern that we've got under this government. Uh, but this is a government that has no plan except to tell struggling Australians they should just work harder. The mo question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the Senate take note of the answers from Minister Cormann in response to questions from Senator Di Natale in question time. Uh, and you know, I use the word answers because that's the pro forma uh, of the Senate, but uh, responses would probably be a more accurate word because, of course, uh, the minister didn't go within a bull's roar of answering the questions that Senator De Natale asked him. Senator De Natale was asking um, Minister Cormann uh, to shed some light uh, on the deal or the no deal between uh, the government and Senator Lambie, which ultimately has resulted in Senator Lambie voting to uh, repeal the Medivac laws earlier today. And I want to focus, uh, to begin with, on one particular part of Minister Cormann's answer, because he was asked by Senator Di Natale about whether there had been an exchange of letters between um, the government and Senator Lambie in regards to uh, ensuring Senator Lambie's vote to repeal the Medivac legislation. And Minister Cormann would only say that he had not exchanged letters or that he had not written a letter to Senator Lambie. Well, what about the Prime Minister? Did he write to Senator Lambie or exchange letters with Senator Lambie? What about the Minister for Immigration, Mr Dutton? Did he write a letter to Senator Lambie or exchange letters with Senator Lambie? We simply don't know. But what we do know is someone is lying to the Senate and therefore someone is lying to the Australian people. And the truth will out, as my mother always used to tell me. But I want to make the point that if there is, as Minister Cormann and the Prime Minister in uh, question time in the other place has said today, that there is no deal with Senator Lambie, then what Senator Lambie's done has given her vote to the government to repeal the Medivac legislation for absolutely nothing. She has got nothing out of the government. And she has voted, if that is true, and there is no deal or agreement, she has voted to take away a crucial medical provision that ensured that sick people get the health treatment they need. Let us remind ourselves why Medivac was necessary. Hamid Kazai died of a leg infection because of the inaction of this government. Eleven other people died in this government's care while they were in offshore detention. This government fought tooth and nail to keep suicidal children locked up 
on Nauru. And it was only a massive public campaign that caused these children to be released from that exile last year. A woman who was raped was denied a termination by this government while she was on Nauru. Ms. Minister Dutton and Prime Minister Mor Morrison have worn their cruelty as a badge of honour, and I truly hope that they and others are one day held to account in the International Criminal Court for how they have broken people. And I want to end with a message to the propagandists and the stenographers at the Courier Mail and the Australian. I hope you are all happy today. You have played a pivotal role in the misinformation campaign that has marred this entire debate. And I'm going to name them up. Those propagandists and stenographers include Simon Benson, Joe Kelly and Rene Valaris. I do hope you're happy with the propaganda and the stenography that you've engaged in in recent months. I hope you're happy that your cosy relationship with the authoritarians and the fascists in the Liberal, Liberal National Party can continue unabated. Your cosy relationship with the rampant human rights abusers in the LNP can continue unabated. Your little secret drops and your sunny little interviews with the merchants of misery can continue. You, Joe Kelly, Simon Benson, Rene Valaris, are doing the work of ministerial media advisers while you are masquerading as journalists. You've got the gall to call, call yourself journalists, but you're not. You're propagandists and stenographers, and I hope you're all ashamed of yourself. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh,